It's, uh, I'm enjoying this music, actually. <laughs> nice um, touch. Thanks, thanks all for sticking around for the last session of the day. Hopefully you've been thinking about what questions you'd like to ask Alistair. Um, I'm going to start the session by asking some of my own. Um, when the microphone comes to you, just remember to wait for it. It's not a prop. It does work if you hold it right up to your mouth. We'll hear you more clearly. Um, but let's start where you started. Um, so you are uh, 45, uh, 25. Thanks. Sorry. That's my age, by the way. Um, <laughs> born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, yes. uh, at the height of the Troubles. Uh, moved to apartheid South Africa with your family. Yes. So you are old enough to have lived that. Yeah but probably young enough to have reached maturity at a time when South African sport coming out of apartheid was going through a, re a really positive kind of phase, yeah. thinking particularly the netball team, the rugby union team, the cricket team. Perhaps you could give us some insight into what that culture of sport and achievement was like growing up at that yeah. time. I mean, if... Um you know, if you're very familiar with the Australian uh, way of living, it's very similar to South Africa, except we have, um, w back, in the, back in the day, there was other challenges that we had. Uh, so you're right, I was born in Belfast. Um, two days after I was born, the part of the hospital was, was bombed. It was in the, the time of the 70s in, in Northern Ireland, which was very, uh, there was a lot of turmoil. Uh, parents, parents took us, to, uh, me and my three brothers, to South Africa in 81. Obviously, it was, it was apartheid South Africa. I was too, too young to really understand what was going on. Uh, but you, you start to pick it up later on. I mean, uh, you know, in the 80s, you, you're in an all-white school. You're in an all-white, you go to all-white beaches, uh, white churches, white supermarkets, and so on and so forth. So that was, in, that was indoctrinated in you at a very young. Um, the schooling system as well was under apartheid system as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was a very tough upbringing, uh, corporal punishment in schools. Um, uh, every Monday we'd have type of army training as well, because when you're 18, it's a little bit like the Israeli army, where when you're 18, you, you do two years of service in the, in the military. Uh, my brothers went, my oldest brother fought in the Angola War. Um, you know, you're straight out of school at 18, you go straight to war. That was back in those days. So, you know, I was very young at the time, but at a very young age, I, f I, I, I had a lot of black friends and a lot of friends of color because I would run and I would, uh, I would be in the track and field team and running team. So I had a lot of black friends who didn't go down too well at that time in, in, in South Africa. So for me, I knew at a very young age, um, I wanted to be brilliant in something. I wanted to be a, a world champion in, in, in a sport. And uh, probably from the age of 10, I knew I wanted to get out of South Africa. It's a beautiful country, fantastic people, but I just wanted to get out. My dream was to be in, in the United States of America. Um, so I worked very hard in sports, uh, became South African 5,000 meter champion in juniors, uh, won the two-time national triathlon championships, and that got me a ticket to get out of, out of South Africa. Now, don't get me wrong, I love South Africa, but I wanted to explore the world. I wanted to become something bigger. You had a dream to be a tennis player. From yeah, at the beginning to be a tennis player, but uh, like anything else, uh, it becomes very expensive. Uh, you know, when you get to a stage in badminton or any sport, you need better coaches, you start to travel, that's where the expenses start to come in. So I gave tennis up because I knew running would, wouldn't cost much. Even in South Africa, you didn't run in shoes. In school, you ran barefoot, you played rugby barefoot. Um, I was very, very privileged. I must admit that the South African schooling system, you play s sports was a big, big thing. And uh, I played seven, eight sports. So, you know, it, the weather is great. So it's very much like Australia as well. So, um, yeah, it was a very interesting time. I feel privileged to be brought up in that time as well. Remember Nelson Mandela being released. I remember the 95 Rugby World Cup. Um, but, yeah, it was... I feel proud to, be, to work through that, to have been through that. There's some classic examples from more recent South African sport of the likes of A.B. de Villiers, who I think at school was the 100 meter champion, the 200 meter champion, the 400 meter champion, the cricket captain, the swimming captain, I mean, he did, he did everything. I mean, was that, yeah. was, 
he is obviously an exception, but was there a sense that that was the norm, that that was how sport was yep. treated? Yeah, especially in high school, um, you know, we had the talent identification um, one, which was, which was fantastic. Uh, South African system as well was, um, that was another thing. If you were good in sports in school, you would go to a better base for your army. So they would, pres they would keep the good athletes and not send them to the, 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 the tougher so the, the, army bases or to Angola or whatever. Quite, quite an incentive yeah. to run fast then. Exactly. <laughs> so my brother played South African rugby uh, uh, under 19s and we were all like determined to <laughs> not go to the rough, the rough part of the army. So there was always an incentive. Um, you were driven to, a lot of, you'll know a lot of South Africans out there, we're, we're very determined, we're very, you know, I, I had this work ethic and this attitude at a young age was that no one will outwork me. I might not be the smartest hamster in the cage. Uh, I struggled through school academically, but I just thought no one will outwork me. And at a young age, I, I realized that attitude and work ethic will get me f further. Yeah, so. <clears throat> There's a moment of realization, I suppose, for every aspiring athlete uh, when they realize that those specific dreams that you may have uh, started with are not going to come true that there is a different path for you, and yours was in coaching. How did that come about? When did that happen for you? You know, it's funny. I can remember uh, being in the kitchen. I must have been 14, and I was speaking to my mom, and uh, I was crying because I realized that I wasn't going to be a professional tennis player, and uh, I was going to go into running, whatever. And she said to me, don't worry, son. You'll probably make a good coach one day. And I said, coaching? I don't want to go to coaching. I want to be a professional athlete. And she was right. I eventually became became a coach, and it's been um, it's been the best years of my life. And you know, as I explained today, with staying re relevant, there's coaches that are inspiring me that are 85, 90, that are not nowhere near finished. Um, so, yeah. And we talked a lot about your method earlier. If you haven't trademarked the McCall method, you probably should think about doing that at some oh, point. That's all right here. Some point, so. <laughs> um, well, I, I just want to add there that um, you are a brand. Every single one of you is a brand, and it's important to brand yourself. Your example is your brand. The way you talk is your brand. The way you dress is your brand. The way you conduct yourself on, on the court is your brand. Your brand is your reputation. You know, we think of a brand as a label and so on. So you might recognize the M, oh, okay, that's, that's Alistair's, you know, whatever. But you are a brand. And I think this is what coaches have to realize is that um, your reputation is your brand. And it's your most valuable advertising uh, medium th that there is, is your, is your brand. When did you start to develop the idea that there was, there was a McCall method? Where were you taking inspiration from? Um, it, it, that's a good question. Uh, I've always been very curious. Um, so, you know, people will ask me about my social media and, and so on, and they'll say, who does that for you? And I say, I do it. Um, you know, I'm very curious about marketing. I'm very curious about um, branding. I'm very curious about social media. I'm very curious about things. And again, I'm not the smartest guy academically, but when you have curiosity, and this is the great thing about great coaches and great athletes, they're very curious. Successful people are very curious. They ask questions, they try to find out why. Um, you know, today we live in an age where you can find absolutely everything on, 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 on uh, social media and YouTube and so on. There's no excuse not to, you know, to find out. You can learn how to fix a car on, on the internet, you know. Not that I'd want to try that, but... <laughs> One of the videos that I watched of yours on Twitter, um, you were talking about uh, the importance of a clean dressing room. I don't want any plot spoilers for your talk tomorrow, but there was something sort of uh, almost Jordan Peterson-esque when he talks about when you get up in the morning, make yep. your bed, yep. um, about having your house in order before you go and try and fix anybody else's. Is that something that you had to train yourself uh, to, to do, or is that something that's always come naturally yeah. to you? I mean, obviously, there was a lot of discipline in my family as well, and, and uh, you know, on that point uh, in coaching where you have ill-disciplined kids or parents that come to you, I know I'm diverting a little bit here, but parents that come to you and say, you know, my kid doesn't be, you know, on the court, they act emotionally, blah, 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 and I said, well, all discipline starts in the home. You know, if you're sending your kid to a coach to discipline them, good luck. But all discipline starts in the home. 
The fact that your kid can't control their emotions, they're a brat, you let them get away with things, is starts in the house that you don't have control. And that's a conversation that is not easy to speak to parents about, but that's where it comes from. Um, but yes, there was always discipline. The schooling system was very disciplined, so, so I, I can be grateful for that as well. Um, I believe making your bed in the morning is the, the most important start to your day because it's uh, the first act of discipline uh, of the day and you feel you've achieved something. I mean, the, um, there's a great YouTube uh, thing called, I think it's uh, General McRaven, I think it is, McRaven, who he actually has a book called uh, Make Your Bed in the Morning. And it, it instills the first act of discipline in the day. And actually, it's one of my standards working with young athletes is that they make their bed in the morning. Simple. Even it's one, if, one of my standards as a parent as well. Is, absolutely. Don't always succeed. But. Yeah. But it's your first act of discipline of the day. I make my bed in the hotel. I even make my bed when I leave the room. Because it's not the fact of leaving. It's the fact of doing that chore for myself that makes me think I've achieved yeah. something today. Now, now the next thing. So, uh, so each day becomes a series of micro achievements, effectively. So you're not exactly. you're not dreaming of the bigger goal, uh, you know, in a year's time. It's, exactly. It's a, it's achieving small things regularly that pushes you forward. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of what you've talked about there is the culture in which athletes live. You talked a bit earlier about Klopp. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, Liverpool manager, I suppose Pep Guardiola might be a good example if you're really stretching your imagination, maybe Maurizio Pochettino at uh, Spurs. Um, but uh, do you see the culture of coaches starting to change and the uh, approach, that authenticity, that trust that Klopp brings outwardly? Are you seeing that permeating football generally, sport All sports. generally? All sports. This generation aren't... Um Generation Z and, and a little bit of the younger millennials are not responding to autocratic uh, style of leadership. If we look at uh, Jose Mourinho, um, his last five years have been not successful um, in terms of his standards. And I think he's had to change some things in his personality. I mean, I've been listening to Mourinho in a few interviews the last few months, and I've never heard the word empathy more from him. Mm -hmm. So maybe something's changed there, for example, where he's realized, you know, with, with um, Manchester United and with, uh, who was before Man U, it was um, Chelsea maybe? Uh, where Real, Real Madrid. Real Madrid, where yeah. his style of coaching and leadership mm -hmm. was no longer working. Mm -hmm. A very successful coach 10 years ago, but today, not so much. I'm very curious to how he comes back with that. But yes, um, uh, today's coach is, as a, you know, we had a quote up there about less ego, which is more, to, to be honest, more male, is, has more ego, um, uh, more facilitating and not dictating uh, is, is an important one, and empathy. Again, really understanding the other person, emotional intelligence of, of really understanding that other person. So those are the qualities of great coaches today. Those coaches that are more autocratic, more uh, hardline, they're getting, f they're getting phased out. Ego, of course, works both ways because uh, it is a relationship, not just a connection, as you talked about. Uh, do, do you find athletes in some sports harder to coach than others? Do you find athletes from certain countries harder to, or certain regions harder to coach than others? Do you, yeah. how, do, how do you adapt to those kinds of differences moving as you do from discipline to discipline? I've never worked with one successful athlete that was easy. Uh, I'm not talking about personality, I'm talking about um, their standards. Why they are a great athlete is because they have high standards. So successful people are usually difficult to work with. Even though you might see them on TV, oh, what a nice guy or what a nice girl, and they must be so great to work with, and you're like, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, behind the scenes where, where they're, they're, they're respectful, they're, they're mannered, but they're demanding. Um, Kevin, who's number five in the world, uh, is always asking why. Why? They're very smart as well. Top athletes are very smart, I find. They're very inquisitive, they're curious. If we do something last week, and it was, let's just say, three sets of 12, and we're doing three sets of 10 today, he'll say to me, Last week we did 312, why are we doing 310? You've got to have an answer. 
they, they, they challenge you. Now, the coach I was 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to handle it because I think he's undermining me, he's being cheeky, he's asking questions too much. Now, I, now we as coaches have to have the why because this generation want to know why. Why are we doing this? Why? And they're not being, they're not being, um, and the subordinate, yeah. they're not being ill-mannered yeah. or yeah. disrespectful. Yeah. They really want to know why we're doing this, you know, and some coaches can think that's pretty disrespectful, you know. Yeah. I'm going to um, go to Twitter, actually, aptly enough, uh, for the first question. We, we asked earlier in the week uh, if anybody on Twitter uh, had questions for Alistair. So the first of those is from Kaylee 27 and she asks, I'm trying to get a player to just play and not worry and be anxious about outcomes. How do I persuade them to just play? And she capitalizes the last play. Yeah, th there's no easy answer to that. I mean, we all have players like that as well that get lost in, in, the, in the moment. So first of all, they have to understand what choking is or what pressure is. And it's basically choking or, or f what they, sell, they, they call freezing is as simple as this. It's not being in the moment. When you're choking, you're either thinking in the, in, in the past or you're thinking in the future. Example, um, oh, here we go again. At 9-9, nine, nine, I always, always do this or whatever it is, or a tight point, I always do this. That, mind, that voice comes back. Or thinking in the future, if I lose this point, I'm match point down. If I lose against this girl, um, it, you know, it, all this stuff starts to come in. That's why they get to that place. Um, process needs to be taught in practice. You, you know, you just can't tell an athlete in the match, stay in the process. That is something that has to be, you have to be on top of that in practice. When you see the player not in the, in the process, tell them. Too many coaches step back and practice and just watch points. They don't watch behaviors. They don't watch where that where that that you know that tight point is or that tight period in the matches where we can address that. You know, you always have to be looking for teachable moments when you coach. You know, not just in the technical side, the tactical side, but also the the, the mindset side as well, uh, which is important. Even even stopping play and saying, "What were you thinking there?" Just curious, honestly. They might say nothing, or they might say get your serve in or whatever it may be, well, but it's... We, we saw Lars do it earlier with, uh, with, with one of our athletes. Yeah. What should you have been doing? What were you actually thinking in that moment? She was thinking, I'm, I, I want to win this rally. I want to prove a point. Here. And that's great coaching, yeah. is, is yeah. get but into he the... Looked, he saw that. Yeah, yeah get into yeah. the minds of your, your athletes. I mean, it doesn't have to be all the time. Like, what are you thinking? What are you thinking after every point? But like Lars did there, what were you thinking? That's how we get to those places easier in their heads. Because if we're not asking what's going on in their heads, you're not a mind reader. You, you can't figure it out. And you don't have to be a mental skills coach or have a certificate now. You're just basically saying, what are you thinking? At that point, what were you thinking? Okay, good. What would you do next time? Ask good questions. You know, we've got to teach... We've got to teach more than coach, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There is a difference, even though they say teaching is coaching and coaching is teaching. But, um, you know, we've got to find those teachable moments. There is, of course, an awful lot of information now available for players to process. And you obviously talk a lot about culture and behaviors. You don't talk a lot about science and data, which, of course, is another aspect of performance analysis that has increased... Mm. exponentially and, and particularly I would say in the last five to ten years how do you keep an athlete's mind clear of those things but at the same time use the important bits from them to, yeah. to help further their performance yeah good question because sports science is obviously something that's very very big today and it's not new sports science has been really at the forefront for the last say 15 years I'd say I mean it's always been there's been a form of sports science 30 years ago, but um, I believe sports science has made, uh, now the, the sports scientists aren't going to like me for this, but I, be <laughs> I believe sports science has made athletes weaker. It's made them mentally weaker because obviously sports science is necessary for load uh, production, for recovery, for knowing what's going on in the athlete, but it's also put limits on them. And uh, of course, this is my opinion, but it's put limits on how far they can go. You know, you know, they're getting to a red zone, 
the guys jump in, that's enough. But, you know, in matches and tournaments, you're going to the red zone. How do you deal with that red zone? Or, do, you know, because you've always been used to, like, oh, you've got to recover, got to step back, bring it back down, example. So um, Alan Pardew, who was the, the, the coach of Crystal Palace, which is an English football team, he, he brought out something a week or two ago about saying that um, sports science is making, us, making the players weaker. Now, we need sports science, I agree. However, are we giving them too much leeway in, in sports? Are we giving them too much of the say in sports? GPS trackers, that, this, they're wired up. Um, you know, last month I was at uh, Paris Saint-Germain and, and I think they have, uh, they have a fantastic team there. I spent two days with them, but they have four sports scientists with the first team, four. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a lot. I bet you'd all love that kind of budget, wouldn't you? <laughs> four sports scientists. Yeah. Per, per player. Um, one of the other things that athletes are now having to contend with uh, that has moved sport on ac across the board uh, are law changes. And these are particularly uh, changes in rules and laws that suit broadcasters uh, particularly and the marketing side of sport. So thinking about things like shot clocks, for mm. example, shorter forms of the game that change tactics, change approach. I, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that T20 cricket, 2020 cricket, is not the first sport to have done that. But people talk about now about what is our, what is our T20 going to be, whether it's three on three in basketball, mm. whether it's shorter games, whether it's... Um, not sc scoring on any point, not just on your own serve. I mean, there are many multitude of, of, of different examples. Um, how do you adapt as a coach to to those changes in terms of um, uh, keeping a kind of clear mentality for the players? And yeah, obviously. And, and, and what kind of pressure have you noticed that those? Things yeah, obviously, I mean, you've got to abide by the rules as a coach. So if they change the shot clock to 20 seconds like they did in tennis, 25 seconds, you have to abide to that. Now, a player that might have a routine, the best players have routines between points, as we know. Uh, their routine might take a while. So, for example, in tennis, they go get the towel, they get this, that, and then it's like 40 seconds, and, you know, that's the problem R that's Rafa coming. Rafa sending coded messages to the... Yeah, the that is that yeah. as well. But, you know, I'm just using tennis as an example, but you don't realize that in the Grand Slams, the courts are bigger. The, the space between the, 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 the baseline and the back wall. On TV, you don't see it, but the, the baseline to the back wall is pretty much where I'm sitting right now is the baseline and the back wall is there. So that's a good 10 meters behind. Mm -hmm. So to me to walk back there to get my towel is 10 seconds. I come back, it's 10 seconds. I bounce five times, 30 seconds. You know where I'm going here. That's why they had to bring that in. Golf, I see now, the last two or three weeks, a lot of complaints by players complaining about slow players. Bryson DeChambeau being the, Without mentioning post, names. the, the, <laughs> the poster boy for slow play at the yeah, moment. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You're, you're up to date with a lot yeah, of your sports. I like that. Um, I do try. There we go. Uh, you know, there's a problem there in golf now where it's just taking too long. It's killing viewership. Is that like waiting for this guy to hit the ball? He goes back. He looks at it. He goes back. He looks at it. And you know, like, oh, switch over to something else. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's necessary. It's necessary. You know, people want to see action. They don't want to just see a you know 20. We have to wait 30 seconds until the next point or whatever it may be. So we have to, you know, like I said, we have to adapt to that. You have to have the player prepared for that. I'm going to go back to Twitter and then I'm going to open up to the, the audience here, because I'm conscious that um, the evening is uh, not slowing down. Uh, Ewan Williamson on Twitter wants to know about in-game coaching, um, specifically looking at an example, let's say, between tennis and badminton. Uh, in tennis, it's perhaps not unique, but it's certainly unusual that the coach is not allowed to communicate with the player during play, and you see players look to their box Novak, Andy, uh, sometimes not happy at the lack of response. Mm -hmm. Other players, Serena uh, being an example, got into trouble for there being too much back and forth between mm -hmm. her and, and the box. 
in badminton, by contrast, you can coach the player on every point. Mm. You have a break mid-game where there's the opportunity to instill some more. Where's the balance? What, what are tennis players looking for from their box? It's 50-50. Well, you know, it's 50-50. Some, you know, they're doing it. They have a big issue. They have too many separate rules in that game right now. You know, the, the, the women's tour allowed coaching once a, once a set. The men's coaching aren't allowed it. But honestly, everybody coaches. You know, you're whispering to the player when, when they're in the corner. You're, you're, you know, some of them use hand signals. You know, so, you know, if I'm, for example, uh, with my hat, I'm maybe saying hit more deeper or <laughs> whatever it means. You know, we'll, we'll do something, scratch the left shoulder, play the back end. Uh, you know, so every, there's, there's coaching going on all the time. And, and players want it. So for me, you know, it's a split decision. Some want it, some don't want it. Your old traditionists will say, keep tennis the way it is because they have to think for themselves. And then the new gen will, will want coaching. So I, I think there should be coaching, just like there is in squash, just like there is in badminton. Um, is it possible to be too intrusive? Absolutely. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I've, I've watched uh, quite a bit of badminton this week, and, and I, I observe, I listen, I watch... I watch more what's going on with the coach interaction, and, and in some cases there are there's too much information. So what what would your advice be? In a room full of badminton coaches here. There's um, what what would you say about body language, about how you comport yourself at, at the side of court in such close proximity to your charge? Yeah, obviously it's the timing. I mean, you've got to you've got to know your athlete. You've got to feel your athlete at where they are mentally, where they are. You know. Um, I never think it's a good idea to give uh, critical advice or tactical advice when they've just lost a point or two in a row. I always think the right timing is when they've maybe won a point where they're feeling a little bit better or two points, and then you, you bring in that, listen, you know, whatever it may be, step in a little bit more, or get into zone three a little bit more, whatever it is. But a player who's going through a, a frustrated time or whatever, you've got to be very tactical of, of when you say something. Um, I don't know who it was who mentioned it, but uh, I think it was with the All Blacks as well. With they f coaches, especially before matches, overload information. A little bit of their emotions are going as well. They overload. The player is ready. The, the, in fact, the 10 minutes before a match, I never like to speak to a player because I let them get into their zone, their thinking. You know, you'll find it as well, coaches, and I used to do it. They're two minutes before going on, and you're still loading them with something. Hey, hey, remember to, remember to do this. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I've stopped that. You know, if you, the preparation is done. They're either ready for the exam or they're not. Mm -hmm. um, give them their last information. I like to give them their last information 20 minutes, 30 minutes before, and, and it's simple. Maybe two things. Yeah. My, my advice to players is always, number one, play your game. Play to your strengths, number one. And then uh, number two, I might give them one or two things about the opponent. That's it. And then you're lucky in badminton is that you do have the opportunity to sit, to sit and adjust one or two things if you see that player is adapted to that, whatever. But that's it. Just two things. I call it in, in the seven keys to being a great coach, J2. Just two. Two bits of information. Good. Yeah. Lots to digest. Um, I'm going to open up to the floor. Uh, we probably have about... Ten minutes, I would say, looking at John. Thumbs up. Would anybody in the audience like to start us off? I can't have exhausted all the <laughs> questions. I'm impressed, though, that they stayed on. So We've good got job, one guys. in the middle here, Thank one just in the middle here. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> if you could let us know your name and where you're from, that would be great. And your bank account, please. <laughs> I think your, yours is uh, better than mine. Bank no, account. I've got seven, <laughs> seven ex-wives, so it's, it's costing me quite a bit. G kidding. Okay, so my name is uh, Selwa, and I come from France. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you um, for accepting to be here. Uh, your you. conference was, uh, speaking for myself, very inspiring uh, you. on how to become... Um, and stay uh, the best coach possible, mm -hmm. maybe also the best person possible. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, and I would like to ask you um, how um, it, it is about the path that you followed during your career 
uh, what made you move from um, a former successful athlete and new by coach to um, a world-renowned um, performance uh, expert and mm -hmm. mindset, mindset expert. Um, what is the key mm. to moving from this position to yeah. what you are today? Finding my passion very early of sports and then obviously um, helping others get better was something that, that motivates me, that, that's my purpose as well. So it was very easy. Um, I always recommend to athletes is that start setting up your career at least four years before you finish your career. So it's something um, uh, that's also mentioned in the book as well. I think it's Champion Minded. It was where I talk about an identity crisis is that you become, you know, Kim the badminton player or John the golfer or whatever, and they, they have this difficulty when they come to their end of their career. For me, it was different. I was already setting up my career, my next phase of my life while I was still an athlete. I wasn't being an athlete and then, oh, what am I going to do now? Um, so while I was on the road, I would be doing correspondence studies of sports management and nutrition. And I, I just try to do as many things as possible of just learning this whole environment as much as I could. And um, that's how it metamorphosized. Yep. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think, towards the tail end of your presentation about watching documentaries. Um, you mentioned you had a book list as well. I went to a school in uh, Scotland to address a group of 15-year-olds, which is a thankless task, I can, <laughs> uh, I can tell you. Uh, and it was about career choices, and it was about where people go in life and the decisions you make. And the thing that I came back to right at the end, which is a regret of mine as I look back on what I did in my late teens and, and through my 20s, was I didn't read enough. Mm. And I found since I started reading again, and particularly maybe your books, mm. maybe other people's, um, those, are, those are the places that I draw inspiration for, for ideas of what might come next or where or how I could move myself from position A to position B mm. and start thinking of my life as something different than just being a guy who worked at the BBC mm -hmm. into somebody that wants to go and be an entrepreneur or, and in your case, wants to do something different. Do you have any, what would be on your reading list? What would your desert island library Ooh, be if you, to, if you had to um, take three books um, that could help answer that question? I always read Slight Edge every year by Jeff Olson. Uh, it talks about the, the the one percents every day. I know we've heard that it's very cliche, but you know, if you're to look at a timeline of of January to December and the choices we make, we, either we're eating healthy, we're eating healthy, we're exercising, we're doing the right things, and that line curves up, but we don't see it curving up. Contrary to that. We make poor decisions. We, we sleep in, we have a poor breakfast, or we have no breakfast, we don't exercise, we, we're eating poorly at night, and that curve starts to go down, but you don't realize it. Just like you can't see yourself every day losing weight or gaining weight. Uh, you have a salad for a, for a day, will you see a change? No. You have a salad for a week, will you see a change? Not really. Month, maybe a little. Mm -hmm. A year, yes. You know, you come back and like, wow, what happened to you? You're looking amazing. But you don't see that. That's how habits are created over, over days. So the slight edge talks about that, of how we don't see things creep up day by day. And then a year's time, you see, oh my goodness, now it's, you know, what's, what's happened. Uh, what other books? Um, uh, how to Win Friends and Influence People, the second most sold book in the world. It's written in 1925, I think it was. A fantastic book, that one as well, where it's, those principles still live today. You know, How to Win Friends and Influence People. If you haven't read that, it's a fantastic book. I just want to go on to um, the books I wrote. My, the style changed as well, because I knew this generation, and even my generation, aren't big readers anymore. Um, because we have so much information to read now on social media and so on, you don't feel like opening a book. Kids today don't feel like reading another book. They're, they're reading in school all the time. So I, I thought to myself, let me bring out a book that's got chapters no more than two pages or one page. Little bits of information, chunking information, digest this little bit. Can you read a page a day? Yeah, you can read a page a day. 
And that's how I've been able, that's why Champion Minded, especially with kids, has become a very, one of the best sellers, is because you say to them, read a page a day. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. A micro achievement. Yeah, exactly. Make a bed, read a page. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's another thing like for coaches. They give, their, they give the kids too much stretches to do afterwards, 12 stretches to do by themselves. Good luck with that. Maybe 20% will do that. If I give my player four stretches to do, it's achievable, it's done in five minutes, it's better than nothing. You know, when you give a program to a kid that's got 12 stretches and a half an hour warm-up and this and that, you know, there's a 50% chance that's going get, to get done. So keep it very attainable, you know. It might not be perfect, it might not be stretching everything, but keep it attainable, just four stretches. I hope that's helped answer your question. No, sir? It's um, Thank you very much, a wonderful presentation thank and you. a discussion. I'm from India, uh, my name is Anil Ramachandran. Uh, my question is, you touched upon uh, somewhere where the tennis players follow certain rituals. Uh, how important is a ritual for a player mm -hmm. in terms of building up his confidence in the game? By should, should that be something which coaches should look upon individually, uh, very specifically to players, how it can affect the outcome in terms of success? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the first things I look at at a player is their, what they're doing between a point, what they're doing uh, around the court, the changeover, whatever. Incredibly important. Um, a lot of good athletes are very superstitious as well. They drink their electrolytes first, then water, snack, towel. They have these like routines which are, which maybe you don't see or notice, but they are um, part of their, part of their system, so to say. But um, why do we have rituals? Why do we have routines? Is because it 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 helps you um, calm the mind and not be too you know too much anxious anxious or. Um, you know, that's between points, that's the, the, you try to keep it consistent all the time. If you're playing with your strings, you walk to the back of the court, whatever it may be, is that you keep it like that regardless if you're ahead or you're losing. Because you'll find that when players start to lose or they're starting to go down that path, they start to rush. They start to do things that they're not used to. I can always tell when a tennis player or a squash player, and if I watch badminton, I'll pick it up too, is not in the right frame of mind. They either start bouncing the ball three times or six times instead of nine, whatever it may be, you start to see that they're out of sync. They're, they've lost their, their routine because they've let their emotions take over. Uh, so the best athletes do have rituals, routines to help them stay in a level state of mind. So it's important, very important. Someone at the front there while we wait for the microphone. I think it was Jack Nicholas used to say in golf, if he hit a bad shot, he would um, tear the Velcro. He said, tear the Velcro on, the, um, on his glove. Mm. It would be on his left hand, but I'm holding this in, in, yeah. in my right. Tear the Velcro on the club um, as a, a mental break from the last shot. That was, that was mm. it. That last shot is gone. And he would, mm. he would rip the Velcro on his glove. And then he would reapply his glove before he hit the the next shot yep. and start afresh, which, yeah. I, which I thought was Yeah, I mean, an example that I do, for example, is um, I'll tell, tell a player to go to their towel to wipe away the last point. Yeah, yeah, similar. So they go to the point and that's a, that's a, a, a they're not really, they don't need the towel because they're not sweating, maybe whatever it may be, but it's a, um, uh, it's a sign that they're wiping away the last point and when they turn to the court, they're, they're okay. in the next point. Yep. Yeah. Not a question. Hi, um, it's nice to uh, listen to you talk. Um, my name's Yvette, I'm from um, um, Switzerland. Um, I agree with you 100% um, on the seven key being a great coach. And you mentioned um, the good coach will have a standard and also, also we need to adapt to the new generations. Now the, every younger ones all want the fast, cheap and doing less. Um, and also you, want, you, uh, you mentioned that the fundamentals is, is the key for success for athletes. So how will you be able to balance it? about your own stance and also adapt to the new generations, mm. how to get to the younger yep. uh, kids to buy in yep. and how important about the fundamentals? Very good question because the fundamentals are boring and they're repetitive. 
to be honest. So for kids, for kids it is. However, to master a skill, there has to be a deeper understanding in the fundamentals. You know, we see the brilliance of a Ronaldo, we see the brilliance of a, of a Nicole David or whoever it may be, but underneath all that brilliance is the fundamentals first and then they add that extra bit on the end. That is the challenge to a coach is how can you make the fundamentals fun? How can you still teach the fundamentals but keep it interesting and keep it adding diversity but still staying close to the fundamentals if that makes sense? Um, you know, for example, there has to be incentives in, you know, if you're, if you're doing a cross-court drill or you're doing a, a deep drill or whatever it may be, there has to be incentives of, of points in that zone or, or whatever it may be that keeps them engaged in that. They're not just, um, just brain dead, just hitting, 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 hitting. So there has to be purposeful reason to that. So that's the challenge to, to a coach is how do you make the, the boring interesting? Did, did that answer your question? No. <laughs> I suppose you've embraced social media as, as one way to help you communicate that. How have you found that experience? Is it? Well, here's an interesting thing. Um, they did a study with uh, companies in the United States with, with the Generation Z and, and the, the younger millennials. And they find that giving them videos on YouTube of uh, instructional things to do in, within the company and, and training courses is easier done on YouTube than it is done in person because they're a generation that learns from, from their computer more than being able to sit and listen to an hour of, 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 a, of someone talking. So you now find companies investing in, in people that are making instructional videos and they find that's being more successful with, with the kids kids, young adults as well, as that they're learning from, from that easier. Any pitfalls on uh, Twitter yet? Uh, not that I can think of, no. Good. Good. Stay, stay on the right side of that. Uh, last question, I think, um, because uh, we all have homes to go to. Uh, could we get a microphone to this gentleman at the front for the we last question? We can do question? him as well. We can be quick We're good too? So. We do too. Okay, we'll give them Twitter answers. Let's be twi <laughs> yeah, Twitter questions, Twitter answers. Nice okay. and quick. And a, a microphone up at the back as well, so we're ready to go. Okay. Yes, um, my name is David from Singapore. So in coaching and dealing with youths, in, invariably we have to manage the parents. So any advice or experiences on how do we you know, set boundaries, as you mentioned earlier? Yep. You know, and, and have the parents to understand that they don't come in and become coaches themselves. Okay, yeah. that's why, you know, in, in, in the presentation, Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach, number one, it all starts with your standards. The first line in the Seven Keys is all starts with your standards. That's where you set the boundaries, and you have to be clear, and you have to be convicted on them. And you have to get the parent to agree to that, because ultimately they are the, in, you know, in charge of their kid, for example. Uh, and you have to follow that up. If they see they can bend those rules, then they're going to bend those rules, and you're the one that's going to be, you know, coming under the pressure and so on and so forth. Another thing coaches don't do enough is include parents in um, with good communication and what's going on. So, you know, in between classes is not good enough. Like a quick two minutes. I'm sorry, I'm on to my next player. Mm -hmm. They they need to be communicated well. So be it through meetings, once every three months, for example, once every quarter, a half an hour meeting. Parents, of course, are busy. There's school. There's kids. There's there's so on and so forth. So keep it. 30 minutes, maybe whatever time which is suitable, but communicate to the parents. It's one thing I think coaches fall short in. The crazy parents are nothing more than parents that just aren't being communicated well enough yeah. to. That's what crazy parents are. So you can understand it. When you become a parent, you understand where, you know, you get to understand it a bit better. Because you've got them that far, yeah. and now you're handing over responsibility for the next stage of their development to somebody else. Yeah. So it's about expectation management with them from the outset. And it goes back to the things you talked about, being authentic. Yep. So they don't think you're full of BS. Yep. They can trust you. Yep. And, and that you value the input they've had up to that, yep. up to that point. Yep. Um, good question. Good answer. Last one. Absolutely the last one. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, for, uh, thanks for everything today. Um, I'm Jerome from Singapore. Just curious, uh, do you think it's essential for a coach to be playing at a higher level that, uh, than his or her uh, athlete that he's, he's managing mm. in order to be successful? If the answer is no, then what are the key things that you, you manage to do that? Because, you know, 
for like say soccer, when the players have you know controversial tackles and stuff, you will argue, hey, the referee doesn't play at our level, you know. So they have a lot of controversial arguing about this point. Yeah. So in the coach and athlete view, what was your view for that? Yeah, I, I think, uh, no, you don't have to be a, a great former player to be a great coach. They're two completely different skills. Um, coaching is a skill set that's learned. It does help in a way to have to be an ex-player and, and, and to also have the skills. That is a bonus to be an ex-player. An ex uh, you, you do get a, a level of respect as well from the athlete knowing that you did something. Um, that's why I always find it's, it's great for coaches to sometimes you know, this is where insecurity comes in. They don't want to bring anybody else in, but I do this as well. So, for example, I've got a player in the U.S. Open where I've brought in a former top 10 player to mentor him for a week or two at the tournament. Um, you know, so that those type of things are good. But no, you don't have to be a great former player to be a great coach. In fact, uh, you know, the soccer clubs I go to and yeah. one at Basel yesterday, I asked him, what level did you play at? One of the head coaches he said, no, nothing great, but... He's the bit, one of the best coaches, so, yeah. yeah. Klopp, Klopp, Pochettino, Benitez, yeah. Benitez yeah. Mourinho. Mourinho, non, didn't, non, didn't, none Mourinho of them didn't, play, didn't, didn't play, uh, play, play a level at all, yeah. no, no. Yeah. so yeah. you don't have to, no. So there you go, yay yeah. coaches, go coaches. Yeah. That's a good note to end on. So um, the book uh, that we're giving away, Alistair, is Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach, Become Your Best and they will too. Now, there was a competition earlier yes. to win this signed copy. Why don't you announce the winner and we can invite them up to receive it. It could be prize. a difficult one, so I have got two questions in case they don't get the first one, but please know the answer. For, if you know the answer, put your hand up. Don't all throw up and then there's okay. guesses. Um, the percentage of uh, people that don't feel appreciated in their, their jobs, can you remember what that percentage was? First uh, lady there. You have to be oh, yeah. spot on the number. On, on the money, please. We'll give you one last chance. 60. 58? Well done. Oh, there we go. 58. Well done, sir. Yeah. This is a guy that listens to the small details, I tell you. It was a tough question, I know, but... Um, sweat sweat the small stuff. Yeah. Sweat the small stuff. Um, thank you all very much uh, for your participation uh, and your patience this evening. We, we ran on a little bit, but I think you'll all agree it was worth it. Um, once more, could I please ask you to give your appreciation uh, to our speaker, Alistair McCall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you.